All right, everybody. Well, we'll get started here. Um, and I'm just going to do a very, very quick uh, welcome. So thanks so much to everyone for joining us tonight for what would have been senior week for the Bates class of 2020. Uh, my name is Peter Osborne, and I work in the Bates Center for Purposeful Work. I'm really excited because we have an excellent panel discussion coming your way with some amazing Bates alumni who will share their stories of resilience. Uh, we're especially grateful to our alumni on the Alumni Council and our colleagues at Alumni Engagement and uh, College Advancement for helping us in purposeful work pull this event together. To that end, I'd like to ask Katie, Haw Katie Hawkins, Bates Class of 2005, to offer some brief uh, words of welcome on behalf of the Bates Alumni Council. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm having all sorts of technical difficulties, but I think you guys can hear me, although I don't think you can see me, but that's fine. Um, so just on behalf of the Bates Alumni Council, thanks so much for being part of this important discussion tonight. Um, as you will learn, if you haven't already, the Bates Alumni Community is here for all of you, whether you're graduating on Sunday, you already graduated, or graduation is a year or more away. I mean, one of the best things about Bates is this network that you're part of, both your fellow students and alumni around the globe. I know I'm always excited to be, meet a Bobcat, and I know a lot of other alums are as well. Um, so find us on Bates Bridge, find us at events virtually, or hopefully before too long in person. Um, ask us questions, ask us to introduce you to alums in your industry or your city or region, because we are everywhere and we're happy to help. So Peter, back to you. Katie, thank you so much for those, for those welcoming words. Um, before I kick the discussion over to our moderator, um, I'd like to just cover some quick housekeeping um, and logistical items for our program this evening. Um, this session is being recorded and will be made available for the Bates community. And that includes all of the content in the Q&A and chat boxes. Our program will start with a 45 minute panel discussion followed by a 15 minute Q&A from audience members. And we ask that participants please save their questions for the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, questions can be submitted through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen during the Q&A portion of the program. Um, and we'll call on those people who submit questions through the Q&A. Please don't use the chat box to submit questions for the panelists. And if you do ask a question, please indicate to us if they're aimed um, at a specific person or persons on the panel. Um, in just a moment, I'll actually be turning my video off during the discussion. Um, and if all goes according to plan, I will actually fall off of the screen, which will be excellent. Um, but I will be managing the Q&A behind the scenes. Um, so I will still be here. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you now to uh, Maya Church, a uh, member of the Bates class of 2020 and a stalwart student member of our team in the Center for Purposeful Work, who will be facilitating the conversation this evening. Hi everyone, um, my name is Maya Church and I'm currently residing in Atlanta, Georgia. During my time at Bates, I was a gender and sexuality studies major with a um, double minor in education and dance. Um, as graduation approaches, I'm looking forward to discovering what passions I can creatively expand on, especially taking into consideration the current state of our world and country during this pandemic. Um, we're really grateful to have the members of 2009 on this panel, especially given what you all went through during and after the last big recession. We're looking forward to hearing about how you navigated through those difficult economic times to make it your current roles now. So to kick things off, can each of you share your name, major, what you were involved in at Bates and where you are now. So Manuela, you can start off, us off. Hello, my name is Manuela, graduate of 2009. 
I was a religion major with a focus on the African diaspora, did my thesis on the Afro-Brazilian religion of Candomblé. Um, I was not the most involved Bates student, I will admit, but I was a part of Latinos Unidos where I would host Latinx folk that were interested in Bates. And I also spent a lot of time in Olin Art Center. Um, I've been working in tech startups for over a decade since graduating from Bates, but last summer I actually pursued a dream and a career change and I'm now proud to call myself a product designer. Um, but I just graduated in March and so I'm on the job search again in a recession and I'm currently residing in Bend, Oregon and happy to share what I've learned. Arsalan, you are next. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Arsalan Suhail, also part of the infamous class of 2009. I uh, majored in economics while I was at Bates. Um, I was uh, actively involved uh, compared to Manuela. Uh, extracurricular activities were a huge part of my life. I was part of the uh, Letter Muslim Students Association, as well as our South Asian Association, which was called Salam Namaste at the time. I uh, was uh, co-founded and, and captained our cricket team, which was a novel thing uh, back from 2005 to 2009. And then I was involved in a lot of sort of nerdy academic extracurricular activities like the, the debate team, Brooks Quimby Debate Council, huge shout out there, um, the mock trial team, moot court, as well as I was the treasurer of the student government and uh, lastly had the honor and privilege of being the class president at the class of 2009. And so. After graduation, spent nine years in consulting and uh, currently just wrapping up my business school here at the Tuck School uh, at Dartmouth, not too far from Lewiston, Maine. Wow, well, congratulations. Uh, next is Ricky. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ricky Weiskopf. Um, I'm also from the class of uh, 09, or I should say eight and a half. Uh, I was actually a January freshman, so uh, so I came right in the middle uh, of things. Uh, I was also an economics major and, and a math minor. And I played uh, four years of varsity squash um, at, at Bates. Uh, since graduation, uh, I've done a, a few things. I, I have coached squash. I have, uh, and then after squash, I um, was introduced to technology and now I'm working as a product manager for a e-commerce SaaS startup in Philly. Okay, and our last panelist um, is Stephanie. Hi everyone, I'm Steph Housen. I was a gender studies and religion double major. And while I was at Bates, I was a multi-faith fellow and also a student and graduate admissions blogger. And I was telling this group I had gone back to my blogs in preparation for this panel and they're very embarrassing, um, but also very fun to read. Uh, I'm currently in Seattle working at Seattle University where I'm the Director of Development for University Initiatives. There I'm building the university's first philanthropy program for parents and I built my career in higher ed fundraising. Okay, so with that, we will actually start with you, Stephanie. So um, how would you describe your recession resilience story? Um, what were your plans leading up to graduation? What did life after Bates um, look like for you? Yeah, well, so I'll start by saying that we all share something in common and it's more than just a Bates degree. You know, while I want to acknowledge that the challenges that our panelists experienced in 2009 are not really the same as what you'll face during this pandemic, we all graduated into an ambiguous economic environment. And I'll be the first to say that I felt a lot of fear and uncertainty in 2009, and I'm sure many of you feel that way now. And you can look at the situation and say, wow, that's really unfortunate for me. Uh, and you know, when I look at this panel, I see how those trying circumstances really made us stronger and more strategic, both professionally and personally. And I think it's partly because Bates prepares you well, but another big part is that you will develop resilience and insight into yourself during this challenging time. And when you find employment, which you all will if you put the work in, uh, you'll have the confidence that comes from doing hard things. So I would describe my recession resilience story as compounding, kind of like interest. Uh, when I first began my search, it felt like I was expending a ton of energy and not much was moving. 
but after learning and adjusting and receiving feedback and seriously working on my plan for a few months, I was really able to break through a critical threshold and I felt like some major things started to happen for me. So I think it's really important to recognize that this process will likely take time for you and that does not mean that you're failing. I had zero plans leading up to graduation, except knowing that I was moving to Boston. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut, so um, you know I was moving out of the house. Regarding a job as a gender studies and religion major, I knew I didn't want to be a professor or a clergy member, and that was about it. I had no insight into what I wanted to do professionally. So, you know, my life as a postgrad was really me grappling with some big questions kind of like we do at Bates, except I was alone all day and there was no commons. And, you know, I think it was really helpful for me to take time to understand my values and my strengths and to think creatively about the hard and soft skills I had gained at Bates and through other experiences. So Queen's University in Australia has something called the major maps, which offer hard and soft skills as well as career examples for many common majors. This resource wasn't around in 2009, but I think it would be helpful for many of you today as you think about, you know, what you uniquely bring to the table. I use my personal insights to craft a story that guided my job search, my resume building actions, and my networking conversations. You know, don't wait until you have the perfect story to take action. You really need to balance contemplation and action, otherwise you're just hiding from the job search. Your networking conversations and resume building activities like temping, volunteering, or online classes will really help you sharpen your story over time. And there are plenty of resources out there to help you think through these questions, including the Center for Purposeful Work. And this is totally a shameless plug. Uh, and you know, I'll say finally, whatever job you take next is not gonna be your be all end all. It truly is a stepping stone. So don't let the stakes feel too high and don't be afraid to say yes to an opportunity that you didn't originally plan for. You know, when I graduated, I kept asking myself what I feel was the wrong question, which was, what do I want to do with my life? And that question really scared me, and rightly so. I mean, it's basically impossible to answer ever, uh, and especially when you're 21 years old. And, you know, the right question for me that kept me moving forward in my job search was, what do I want to do next? How did I become director of development at Seattle University? I started temping as an assistant loan processor at a bank in Needham, Massachusetts. So your first job does not need to define you. It just needs to move you forward. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I just really appreciate what you were saying about contemplation and action and how there has to be a balance because I, during this time, I think that's something that I have struggled with. You know, I'm thinking many things like, okay, what's the next move? What do I want to do next? But when you keep continue to just think about it and have no particular action over time, there will just be nothing as a result. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to move on with the next question. And this next question is for Ricky. Um, do you have an interesting perspective, um, having been like an international student at Bates, what were the like biggest challenges you faced in the months and years after graduation in terms of location, um, connection with family, like? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I think I should have mentioned that in my introduction. I, I, I'm originally from El Salvador. So I, I, I came, you know, from the tropical weather straight up to, you know, the winter in Maine and uh, in January of 05. But um, I'm not sure if there are any uh, uh, international students um, in attendance. But one of the things that as an international student is always on your mind senior year or leading into senior year is uh, kind of your visa situation. Um, you know, what's going to happen after uh, graduation. Uh, usually, uh, you know, uh, students go into uh, a year where they apply for um, OPT, uh, which is, stands for Official Practical Training. Uh, you have to have a job for that, uh, that, you know, is related to your major. Uh, and, out, and once you go over that year, you 
you know, hope that your company will sponsor you for your H-1B, which is kind of the goal, ultimately, if you want to stay in the U.S. to work. Uh, one of the things that was happening at the time was that there were no companies sponsoring visas or there are very few companies sponsoring visas. Uh, if you guys recall, a lot of companies took uh, government money uh, to sort of survive. And one of the, some of the stipulations were, you know, they people needed to hire uh, folks from the U.S. first and then you know uh, get those get those visas uh, distributed uh so it, it, after a few years after sorry a few uh months of like job searching and kind of the visa situation becoming a hurdle i kind of started thinking about what my other options were um in terms of like you know kind of when on my plan b um uh, luckily i you know have a swiss citizenship as well so i i decided to actually go to switzerland Right, didn't this wasn't a this wasn't an issue for me because you know I, I was a citizen. Uh, Switzerland didn't work out as expected, so I came back to the states and I found myself in the same situation again with a visa, uh, trying to get companies to 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 sponsor it, and sort of went to my plan C, which essentially was um, I became a, a, a squash coach um, and kind of like went back almost to uh, to basics, like doing something that I loved. Where I was able to get that that kind of first step, getting the visa, kind of allowing me to situate myself back in the states after being away for a while, uh, and kind of that allowed me to start building up, you know, um, a little bit more confidence, like you know, being employed, doing something that I love, uh, and kind of gave me a little bit more of a clear head into like what was next. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if, if this, you know, to just do anything is it what I took out of this was that, you know, it, it's okay to, you know, if your first plan doesn't work, go to plan B, go to plan C, you know, it, it, the idea, like Stephanie said, is kind of like get yourself um, in a comfortable situation that would allow you to move forward. Um, and so this is kind of difficult times. I have um, one more question that I'm really interested in, Ricky. So as like an international student, what would you advise for current international students that are trying to navigate the job search right now and they're not hearing back from people and they're still trying to figure out um, visas for staying in the US? Like, do you have any encouraging words for that? Um, honestly, uh, one of the things that I, that I would say is like, you know, kind of keep looking um I, I do think that this time is it is objectively a little bit harder than 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 when we graduated um so um unfortunately we we have to kind of we sort of depend on uh companies kind of sponsoring that visa for us so that part is a little bit out of our control but what you can do is kind of you know continue applying this is going to pass and you know that whether this is but happen doesn't happen right now it, you know it will happen in the future I, I honestly i was incredibly concerned about going out of the states and coming back and like having to go through that process again so i honestly thought that by leaving i was kind of like in the back of my head i was like oh man like how am i gonna come back i was under the you know as a student you have your your student visa so that's gonna give you a little bit of a um uh, sort of like safety net but then I was like oh my god I'm gonna leave and then I'm gonna try to come back um, and, you know and, and, and it worked for me so it, it, it's, it's one of the things where uh, I would just encourage everybody to continue applying uh, use uh, the Bates network there's there's people always there trying to help um, honestly one of the biggest uh, helps that I got was actually from Dean Reese who introduced me to uh, the lawyer that I used to to go through the the process of applying for a visa and ultimately a green card. So um, yeah, you know the base is always there for you. Wow, it is is so crazy. Um, Dean Reese has yeah, he's had just such an amazing impact on so many so many classes. I mean, this is a two thousand and nine class, and still he has such an impact in twenty twenty. Um, wow, thank you for your perspective. And we're gonna move on to the next question for our salon. So as the president of the class of 2009, do you remember what the general sentiment of the class um, was upon graduation? And how have you navigated your career since you know graduating from Bates? 
especially now that you're, you know, graduating into a recession again with your MBA? Yeah, no, great question, Maya. I think um, starting off from your first question, the general sentiment of the class of 2009 was that of hopelessness. I think um, the global financial crisis was the, is the only global event that comes remotely similar to this global pandemic that we're experiencing today. However, nonetheless, there were a lot of differences. The differences was that the recession had been going on since a year prior and us being seniors in the class of 2009 uh, we were still operating under the assumption that things were going to open up there was this element of uncertainty but people were still clinging on to a lot of hope however you know that hope turned into excitement because we were still able to have the send-off um, that it comes along with people graduating, which unfortunately the class of 2020 at Bates and even myself here at Tuck graduating from an MBA program, uh, I'm not able to enjoy an experience. And so nonetheless, we were able to enjoy spring term and, and, uh, and short term and had all those festivities and whatnot. And we're able to partake in the, in the, in the traditions that Bates upholds every year. And so the, that sort of turned into excitement and so the weeks after graduation is when it really started hitting people, where when people started returning back to their homes, they started realizing that the economy is not uh, going to be opening up in the next foreseeable future. And uh, they started had to pivot and uh, course correct and look at plan B, C, and D. And so I was fortunate enough to be part of a small contingent of folks who were, was able to get a job while I was still at Bates. And uh, I'll briefly speak to that. And uh, it was very difficult. Um, it was incredibly challenging to say the least. I think Stephanie touched on a lot of fantastic points uh, that you all should be taking notes on. And that is being resilient and being able to continuously network and elevate yourself and upskill yourself. You know, the learning doesn't stop once you get a degree or once you leave school. And uh, as, you, as you, you're going to hear more from Manuela and, and Stephanie's story, everyone's path is so nonlinear that you have to embrace it and make it your own. And uh, that is something that I realized that I was interested in going into investment banking. I turned 180 degrees and went into consulting. And so um, probably for the best because of the global financial crisis collapsing all the global banks. And so... You know, things happen for a reason. Um, this is a proverb that a, a, a mentor of mine used to use um, back in the day, and that is man proposes, God disposes. And so the only thing that we have control over is how we react to situations and uh, how we stay adaptable, nimble, and flexible to deal with the uncertainty, the trials, the tribulations of dealing with a jobless economy. And so, so I think that addresses a couple of the first questions that you asked about the general sentiment and, and how did I and others navigate uh, my career since then. I think uh, moving beyond, I ended up staying at IBM um, as a millennial at that time for nine years before coming to business school. And, uh, you know, I frankly don't know of anyone in my uh, extended social circle who has been uh, at the same company for more than a couple of years. And so uh, the, the, the reason why I stayed at the company was because of the growth, the professional development opportunities, and the expansive uh, opportunities to learn. And uh, that was really the reason why I stayed there. And I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity that I did. And so that's something that I would recommend that everyone consider when they're looking at their first job out of college. As Stephanie said, it is not important. But if you are getting the right mentorship, the right networking, the right growth and learning opportunities, then stick with that and you'll see where, where it takes you in the future. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, I just think what you highlighted about the nonlinearity about um, people's past postgraduate is super important, especially now, because there are even students um, that have received jobs during this time, right? And now their, their start dates have been delayed, or um, some people have even taken back offers, which is something that has been unheard of until now. So everyone's paths, you know, I'm talking to, you know, like a lot of my friends, all of our paths are looking so different right now. But I think the most important thing that you said was, you know, the flexibility of moving forward and just being open to whatever opportunities come 
um, after graduation. So thank you so much. Um, and our last, Manuela, um, while your LinkedIn profile notes you as a freelancer, you also shared how you're graduating from a design program into this pandemic. How are you experiencing this recession? Is your ability to freelance helpful or does it take away from your search for full-time work? Yeah, thanks Maya. Um, so first I wanna say I'm a huge advocate of career changes. It is never too late to make your dreams come true. I don't regret that it took me 12 years to realize because I needed to learn what I don't like to do to figure out what I do love to do. So taking jobs and figuring out what tasks you don't like is arguably more important than figuring out what you do like. Um, back to your question, uh, navigating this recession, it's definitely reminiscent of my time navigating the job hunt in 2009. I find myself asking some of the same questions that I did back then, like, is this hard because I don't have much work experience coming into a completely new career, or is it because it's a recession? I think a little bit of both. However, the freelancing has been a great opportunity in terms of getting more work experience, learning how to advocate for myself, navigating some of those client dynamics, which are all things that come up during the job interviews. Um, so to be honest, even if I wasn't freelancing, I wouldn't be doing a full-time job search because I know myself and that's not good for my mental health right now. So I am balancing the, the job search with freelancing, taking care of my community and doing things that bring me joy. I will say that freelancing does ameliorate a little bit of the pressure from job hunting, allows me to make some income, have new experiences to pull from, um, because a lot is centered around the portfolio when it comes to product design. Um, I had a problem, right? My problem was that I couldn't get a full-time job and I didn't have work experience. So freelancing is actually solving that problem for me because I'm, you know, the the barrier of entry is a little bit lower than getting a full-time job. You don't have to go through the same uh, process. Typically, they look at your portfolio and then uh, you have one screening call. So um, I'm just trying to solve a problem that I have currently through freelancing. Um, yeah, so again, you know, I definitely believe that freelancing can be very, very useful. You can make it full-time work, but right now it's definitely a means to an end for me, but a very, very important one uh, for me right now and one that is actually um, solving a lot of the question or some of the problems that I have right now of lack of work experience and lack of experience to pull from for my job interviews. Well, just thank you for that um, response. You know, I think you highlight a really good point about, you know, finding out what you don't like in you kind of have to do that, you know. You'll have, I've had some crazy job experiences that <laughs> um, I didn't necessarily like, but I definitely learned from in the future, like looking forward, okay, this is definitely what I don't wanna do, but now that I know that, maybe I'm closer to knowing what I do wanna do. Um, so in terms of helping our listeners move forward, what experiences and skills from Bates have you, mo like how has, what has been most valuable um, for you navigating your career and how have you utilized the Bates network? And any one of you guys can answer. Um, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I guess the number one skill um, that I walked away from that Bates inculcated in me was this element of humility. And uh, it sounds it, it sounds a little oxymoronic saying that that's a trait that I walked away with for Bates um, and, and talking about humility. But I, I think ha having the humility and having the self-awareness of yourself is an extremely important skill and attribute that I would encourage everyone to look deeper in themselves and really reflect on who they are and what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and really take that, that, that deep introspective look into yourself and see in your personal and professional areas of your life, wh where do you need to fill the gaps, maybe a knowledge gap or an experience or a cultural um, exposure element that you want to 
uh, game in your life. I think that is something that, you know, Bates really taught me is, is being humble constantly in every single thing uh, that I do in every uh, interaction that I have, no matter if it's the CEO of a company or um, the, the, uh, the person who's a forklift driver in a manufacturing um, plant. And so I think it's very important to hold those values that Bates uh, upholds in us and is constantly ingraining us as, as students and to not let go of those things. So. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you don't really notice how much um, you take away from Bates until you're actually gone. And since the seniors now, like we, most of us have been away from campus since March. Um, I'm even taking a step back and realizing how much I did during my four years. Um, and it's, yeah, it's quite amazing. I'd love to um, also jump in quickly. Um, Arslan, I love what you said about that because I definitely feel the same. Um, I'd say one thing that Bates um, taught me is how to problem solve. We are taught to think at Bates, think critically and solve problems. And um, what you can take away from that is that when you are looking for jobs, you want to be the person to solve that the hiring manager's problem. They have a problem. They need whatever their problem is. They need to bring more uh, eyes to their website, whatever it is. You have to show them that you can solve, that you understand the problem and that you can solve it for them as well. And I, I absolutely think that Bates taught me that, that it, they taught me how to understand the problem and solve it. Um, we're creative thinkers um, and yeah, we're, we're taught how to think. Yeah, oh, just oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say from from my perspective, uh, just the way that um, Bates sort of like you know had a the, the curriculum that I had at Bates just allowed me to experience a lot of different subjects. Um, um, I will be the first to admit that I wasn't great at like taking a breadth of classes. To be honest, I was very concentrated on my major and and minor, but just outside of 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 my sort of educational experience, the the community that comes with Bates also was super important. That also helped me navigate after uh, school. Um, my first job in technology, uh, I got through uh, an alum, Ben Shippers, uh, who runs a software company called Happy Fun Corp. Uh, and he, he introduced me to technology. And since that day, I haven't, you know, I, I love what I do, I, I and, you know, so, you know, one of the things that I uh, that I that I enjoy at Bates is just meeting people from all classes and sort of you know try to create that sense of community where people are willing and you know able to help each other. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what everyone has said thus far. And you know, we've talked about Dean Reese and Arslan mentioned a mentor that he's had, and I think for me. Bates really helped me see the value in having mentors or personal champions, you know, people who believe in you and go to bat for you. And, you know, a champion during this time can really help you hone your career aspirations, give you valuable advice on your marketing materials or job leads. And they can also be the difference, you know, as Ricky's saying, and in my experience between getting a job or not. And this is why networking is so, so important. You know, by putting yourself out there and building authentic relationships, you'll find people who want to see you succeed. I mean, I networked like crazy when I left Bates and I relied really heavily on the Bates network, contacting anyone in industries or positions of interest to me. And a Bates champion helped me get my first fundraising position. Uh, and so, you know, your network really helps set you apart in any time, but especially during a recession. Are there any last words to this, these questions? Okay, um, so as we wrap up, um, what are your final words, last words of wisdom regarding recessions and resilience during this time? I can I can start uh, from our end. Um, honestly, hang in there. Uh, these are this is uncharted territory. These are weird, very weird times. Uh, so you know, 
look into yourself what you have to offer just like you know everybody has said like you know what separates you from everyone else um that self-awareness that arslan uh talked about it's it's incredibly important and and you know uh, just honestly just hang in there this is this will get better and you know everybody will you know land on your two feet and you know move forward Okay, so during this time, um, we'd like to open the panel to a few additional questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question for one or more panelists, um, please know in the question and answer or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a live question. But we're also going, <laughs> I forgot to give the other panelists a chance to um, wrap things up with their last words of wisdom. So. I'll go. Um, you know, I think what Arsalan was saying, you know, a growth mindset is so, so important. Um, thinking about the experiences that you can get during this time, the people who you do meet, you know, what can you learn? What can you take away from it? Um, and how can you use it to creatively write your story? You know, don't wait for the quote unquote perfect job you know, actively search out and take advantage of every opportunity because you really do never know who or what is going to open a door for you. Yeah, just to build off of the great advice that Stephanie and Ricky provided, I'd say a couple of things. First and foremost, patience, perseverance, and resilience are going to be the defining characteristics of successful graduates of the class of 2020. The next couple of weeks, the next couple of months are gonna to be tough. I am in the same exact boat as many of you today, as just 10 years later as an MBA grad. Um, a lot of my peers and colleagues are grappling with the same challenges that undergrads are, regardless of what graduate program they're in. And so I just wanna say, first and foremost, it's gonna be very important for you all to just, just know that it's gonna take time. Uh, the economy is gonna take time to rebound. There is no silver bullet. Uh, this is a very unique circumstance. It's unlike anything we've ever experienced before. You've heard those phrases thrown around a lot about it being an unprecedented time. And it truly is because economic recessions can still be predicted to a certain degree. And as, as an economics major, um, that was something that we studied a lot at Bates is trying to understand what is the cyclicality of these external shocks that we're experiencing in the market. And uh, COVID is unfortunately something that is a very unique beast. And so just know that there are, there are legions of supporters and followers and people who are backing you and who are rooting for your success. And they know that things are gonna be tough and uh, that empathy is there. And so rely on it, leverage it. However, as Stephanie and Ricky and, and Manuela mentioned earlier, the, the first job that you get out of undergrad is not gonna be something that defines your career. As mentioned, the nonlinear paths and how everyone ends up 10 years down the line, you're gonna be looking back at this time and you're gonna be patting yourselves and you should be proud of the fact that you went through this with such patience and resilience and such poise. So that's that would be sort of the defining message. And then I guess a sub bullet underneath is that just take time to settle in and make sure that you're taking care of your mental health. I think this is a, that type of a time where we are putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to work out and stay fit at home and come and upskill and learn and take free courses. You know, give yourself a breather, guys. You all just graduated. We all know how tough the academics are at Bates. And so take a step back, enjoy this time, enjoy the good cheer with family and friends in a socially distanced capacity, but make sure that you're really taking time to enjoy this and don't worry about the future. The future is really, really bright and we're banking on you guys on making sure that the future for the U.S. and for the world is, uh, is going to be great for, to come for generations. So that, those would be my quick points, I guess. And I'll just, um, I don't have much to add from my brilliant peers, but um, I just want to second the growth mindset. Every rejection, every, everything is an opportunity to grow. Um, evolve, evolve your strategy when you're looking for work, evolve your personal narrative. What, what Stephanie was talking about, your personal story, find that, evolve it and tell it and repeat it. That is going to be what holds you through this entire thing. And that's going to be the connection that gets you that job. 
and be creative. Be creative uh, in your day-to-day, -day, but also in your approach. Is there a, a dream company that you want to work for? Maybe they don't have a social media person. Reach out to them. Be creative. Um, again, we're problem solvers, and this is just a problem that we have to solve. Okay, and with that, we will move on to the question and answers. And just a reminder, if you guys have any questions, you guys can go down below on your screen um, and type a question. Um, so our first question is, how did you balance your expectations for what you wanted to do after Bates with the reality of what you could do given the recession? Um, how did you make the choices you did without feeling like you were settling? Sorry, um, th th this question kind of hits a little bit home for me. Uh, this is one of, honestly one of the hardest things that I had to grapple with. Um, just like Arslan, uh, when I was an economics major at Bates, I thought I was going to go into investment banking. and. Uh, that didn't happen. That was the first time that I really felt like I had failed. You know, I had sort of worked uh, throughout my career at Bates, you know, try to get great grades. I was, you know, doing great, um, you know, extracurricular activities. I thought I had everything planned out and all of a sudden that just didn't work out. So that my expectations changed uh, rapidly. Um, one of the things that I that I did kind of after, you know, coming to terms to with the fact that in my mind I had I had failed um, was trying to figure out what I could learn from that. And if, you know, started to look into sort of myself, try to get that um, introspective, almost uh, try to figure out, like, is this really what I wanted to do? Like would have you know, investment banker make me happy? Are there other things that I could do now that would make me happy? Um, you know, I found that uh, coaching squash for a while was uh, kind of the solution. Um, and, and it still felt like it was almost settling to a point, but I started to think about it almost like as a stepping stone. Uh, okay, I'm gonna you know do squash for a little bit. It's going to you know lead to new things. It's gonna allow me to uh, network with people. It's gonna uh, sort of allow me to come back into the states, for example. So I started to using like my next step, almost like a like a tool, and that sort of allowed me to kind of go over that hump of like that fail, that first like real failure, and realizing that it actually wasn't a failure. It was just a change of path. And now my, you know, my new career, you know, turned out to be, I think, better than I what I would have expected in in um, in the world of finance. Honestly, looking back, I I don't think I would have done incredibly well there. Uh, and now I, you know, I love what I do. And this kind of answers um, another question in the question and answer boxes. But I'm sure all of you guys have many different foundational skills um, that you guys started with, with what you guys have now in terms of careers and what are some essential um, skills that people can look through for entry level positions, even though this might not be their dream first job, their, their dream career, what should people be looking for as essential skills? Oh, you want to go, Arslan? Oh, go ahead, Stephanie. I, I mean, I'll, I'll put a plug in for, for the Bates Network and networking for this question, because I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there are some standard skills out there like collaboration or can-do attitude that are really important um, that you can probably find somewhere in your experience to, to make a part of your story. But... I think this is where talking to people who have been doing what you're interested in doing for a few years, they can really give you that insight. And that's a great informational interview question to ask, um, to hear from somebody, you know, what characteristics, um, skills and experiences they value the most. 
Yeah, just to build off of Stephanie's point, I think it, it, it'll be important. So I think the answer is different for everyone. I think people who are coming from the left brain uh, side of things, I think they need to start getting comfortable with right brain um, uh, sort of activities and vice versa. And so what I really mean by that is people who are storytellers should start becoming more comfortable with numbers. And similarly, people who are very data driven and you know the econ, the math majors, the physics majors who are on the line today, I think you all need to take a leaf from your humanities and other social science majors and peers and be able to become more creative and, and be able to assume some of those traits from other people. Because I think as you are looking for entry level jobs, you have to remain as flexible as possible. You will be thrown jobs that you never thought you wanted to do or never thought you could do, but you'll be shocked at how a Bates grad can really do everything. And a couple months in, you'll be learning something and you'll be really enjoying it. But the first step is to really take that introspective look at yourself, see what your skill sets are, what are you really good at, but then also try to balance out your skill set as much as possible. Because again, we're talking about the new normal, we're talking about a new economy, we're talking about changing skills. And so you wanna try keeping your, yourself as up to date as possible with those new skills that are required. And obviously be targeted based off of the industries that you're going for. If in the future you plan on becoming a data scientist, then it'll be well worth it for you to start taking more computer programming courses and get more proficient in statistical programming languages like R, Python, et cetera. Similarly, if you wanna take a path and become a designer, then similar to Manuela, go down the path of becoming a UX, UI designer, understand how, how do I become more artistic and creative in that space. So I think it really depends on what your goals are, but try fitting the skills and try filling those gaps as much as possible. I think quickly just uh, following up on, on our plan, uh, and this is something that came up when in discussion prior to the to the panel. Um, back in 09, I think we, there were like fewer um, sort of options for folks uh, to tap into. I think now there's definitely other types of alternative education that folks can take advantage of. Uh, to Arslan's point, like, you know, grab a subject that you're very interested in that you think could be useful in the future, learn it. There's so many tools online that allow you to do that for free. There are great uh, courses there that, you know, you have to pay for. But um, I feel like we're in a, in a, at a point where if you want to learn something, uh, there are resources out there and that will only like build up your profile for when you get to that interview and it's like, oh, by the way. I know this and I learned that, you know, I took the initiative to learn it, you know, that type of sort of mindset goes a long way. And that's what people like to see when you're applying for a job. So another question is, um, did you or any of your classmates make any rash decisions because you were in a recession that they now regret or you now regret? No, not that I can think of. Um, I, you know, I mentioned a little bit um, earlier that I took a job as an assistant loan processor processor. Now I, I'm a gender studies major and a religion major, and I was working at a bank. Um, but even, even from that experience, you know, it gave me something to put on my resume um, and, and it really helped me move forward. So, you know, not for, for myself or my friends. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I don't think um, I can remember um, either myself or my peers making any rash decisions. I think during this time, there are no rash decisions that you can make. I think every decision is something that is very personal um, and, and based on your, your situation, your circumstances. Um, but again, you know, I, I don't think that any decision that you end up making, I think you should stick by it. Um, obviously, it should be a well thought out decision. If it's, for example, if, let me just contextualize it. If the person who asked the question, if you're deciding between taking a job versus traveling for, you know, the, the, for the next six to 12 months, then that's a personal choice, right? And I think that no one should, should impose themselves on you because uh, for some people, 
liquidity is important and having ca being cash flow positive and having a running income is important, then maybe taking the job is, is the better decision versus traveling. So I think it depends on everyone's uh, specific case. I had many friends um, similar to, to Ricky who, who were athletes uh, at Bates and ended up becoming um, either squash pros or coaches, tennis coaches and whatnot. And um, many of them actually, some of them are still doing that eight years later, nine years later, right? Um, they figured out their path. Initially, they thought it was a rash decision and that they were maybe settling as the phrase that, that Ricky used, but um, you know, nine years later, they're still happy with it. So I don't think that there's any rash decision, but just make sure that it's a calculated, well thought out decision. So we have a lot of questions about grad school is, so I'm going to combine some of these questions. Um, so the first one being, do you think it's a bad time to be heading to grad school during the fall in consideration with what's happening in the pandemic? And then um, no decisions on online classes. And another question about returning back to school is, um, when grads have downtime, um, what is something that they can do to invest in technical skill, skill development during the time? So maybe going back to school, just still on that route. Um, so yes, yeah. I will um, just say that um, uh, Stephanie brought up recently about um, personal insights and um, you can do these quizzes. There's the personal insights ones. There's also via characteristics and that gives you a really good idea of what your sort of natural characteristics are. And those could actually uh, bring you success in your job and also um, bring you a lot of happiness and joy. So I would check those out and those, there's then, in addition to that, a lot of resources that show you what careers actually use some of those characteristics. So one of my characteristics is curiosity. So uh, design makes a lot of sense because curiosity, you have to be curious about the world, you have to be curious about others, have compassion, et cetera. Um, and that actually has helped me a lot and has brought me a lot of joy. So back to um, as far as technical skills, I don't, I don't think that there's, I think that there's just so many directions to go in. If you're interested in code, learn code. Uh, maybe day two, you'll realize it's not for you and then just, you know, bow out gracefully. Uh, maybe you're interested in, um, wow, I can't think of other <laughs> things, but anything. Um, and then you try that and you're not interested. So I, I do believe in exposing yourself to a lot of these different um, areas um, because, you know, I did one for 10 years and then ended up changing my career. So um, chase curiosities, something piques your interest, chase it, see where it takes you. And if it doesn't interest you anymore, try something else, but always be evolving, always be trying new things. Um, you know, maybe it's down to the technical stuff, but maybe not. Maybe you really want to learn French or you really want to, whatever it is, just chase those curiosities because they will, uh, they will motivate you. They'll keep you motivated. They'll bring you a lot of joy and they'll get you closer to what you ultimately want to do. Uh, I just want to add for those who are looking to, to go into graduate school, um, I was sort of on the same boat when I was graduating from Bates. That was sort of one of the options that I was looking at, you know, as a, you know, I don't want to say fallback, but as an alternative to not finding a job. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody like thinks through going to graduate school thoughtfully. Um, I, you know, and Arslan, you might be able to add a little bit more to this since you actually went to graduate school and uh, I, I honestly uh, thought they would be an option. Um, when I moved to Switzerland, I, I did a graduate school program and halfway through uh, the program realized that I had done it mostly because it was something that I, you know, as an alternative, I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. I, I thought that I would be able to kind of push through it and come out better um, and, and the other side, but it just didn't work out. Um, graduate school is also an expensive endeavor, so keep that in mind. Um, so, so yeah, you're, you're looking at graduate school, make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons um, and not just because it's something that, you know, you can go to versus finding a, a, a job. 
Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. I think Ricky articulated my answers. I would have said the exact same thing. I think graduate school is a very tough decision. Uh, number one, monetarily speaking, it is a hefty price tag, as Ricky mentioned. Um, so that needs to be um, in the forefront of anyone's mind in thinking about grad school as to what is the return on your investment these days. You know, the future of higher education is changing as we speak. Um, the fundamentals, the economics of higher education is changing and the value proposition of a grad school degree is changing. And so at this juncture in time, unless you've gotten into your dream grad school and dream grad program, may be law school, um, business school obviously requires a couple of years of experience, but if it's med school or any other graduate programs or master's degrees, uh, then by all means do it. I think that that's fantastic because during a recession, um, you know, I would like to draw a parallel they say that during a recession, companies should be investing in R&D. It's a fantastic time for, for companies to be innovating and actually investing a lot of their money in building their qualifications, their credentials for the future. And then I, I apply and extrapolate that same exact concept to human beings is that we, during this time of, a, of an economic downturn, I think it presents a pretty significant opportunity for, for everyone to be upskilling, learning, as we talked about, um, and similarly, by extension, graduate school as well. But again, it should be a very well thought out decision. Uh, there's an opportunity cost involved with going to graduate school. You're going to be foregoing an income. You're going to be foregoing that time. And, you know, uh, as Ricky mentioned, you may end up joining a grad program and then you may not enjoy it. And you realize that it wasn't for you. And then all that time that you've invested in applying and getting in and then joining the program, it, it would have been uh, not worth it. So uh, just be very mindful of all those factors. I think uh, it's not a panacea or a cure-all sort of silver bullet for everyone. I think it's it really depends on your personal situation. Another quick point. I have two master's degrees. I love graduate school. Uh, my second master's degree I got while I was working and so it was covered by my institution. So if you really are thinking about getting a master's degree, potentially, you know, there's the opportunity to find a job at a company. I know Boeing out here in Seattle, even though they're, they're not really hiring right now, but when economic times are good, they will pay for your graduate degree uh, as long as it relates to your work in some way. So there's also other creative ways you can look at going to school while working. So there's another question. Um, I am a rising senior and some of you have mentioned you start your senior year knowing what you're going through during a recession. I am imagining that the job market in 2021 will not be any better. What are your tools you employ to deal with the uncertainty during your senior year? I'll take a very quick stab at this. I think for whoever wrote this and for all of you, those, those of you who are rising seniors, I think your work needs to start now. I think you need to be spending the next couple of months, you have the summer uh, where you, you may have internships, you may not, if, even if you don't have an internship, it is not going to be held against you. Trust me, all the employers and hiring managers know that the rising seniors may not have any opportunities that they could be uh, productively engaged in during the summer. So don't worry about that. However, start thinking about your next steps. If you were initially planning on targeting one industry, start looking at adjacent industries in the same sector. So if you're looking at finance jobs, then in finance, that umbrella is very broad. You can look at a gazillion different opportunities there. Similarly in marketing, accounting, you know, you name it, HR, whatever field is, uh, uh, is, is something that piques your interest, just start being flexible um, and start planning right now. And secondly, start networking. I think your Bates, um, for, for those seniors who are graduating right now, you have a massive, small but mighty network of uh, Bates alums. Leverage that, tap into it, use Bates Reach. Someone had a question about that as well. And just start shotgunning emails out and get on calls with people Tell, tell them about yourself, explain your story, and seek guidance. You know, use these introductory phone calls not to get a job, not to position yourself for next year, but sow the seeds that will help you later um, on in your, in your job process. So, Earlier in the discussion, this will be the last question that we will cover during this panel, but I think it's super duper important um, to 
discuss it a little bit more before this ends about mental health during this period and how we navigate balancing our mental health with taking action to future jobs. How, how should we balance all of that? And what are some, what's some advice for that? I'd love to um, share some thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I am a big believer in positive attitude, the power of attraction, manifestation. I have like a preternatural belief that everything will work out for better or for worse. <laughs> um, but when I graduated in 2009, I'll just share this thing. My parents were going through a divorce and I was having a really hard time getting a job. So uh, point being that I was definitely going through a lot, um, but I, I know I've said this before, we've said this before, the growth mindset that you are evolving, that you will get a job, that things will work out is very, very powerful. Um, you know, community is really, really a big one too. You can rely on your community. Um, I certainly did. I was not alone. We are not alone in this. There are other people who are going through this, who are feeling a lot of the same things. And that vulnerability is a strength. Um, this is a really challenging time in so many ways, and there's so much compassion right now, uh, in my opinion, so many people who want to help, who want to talk, they want to share their advice with you. So we should all be leveraging that. I can say with a thousand percent certainty that while really, really tough right now, you will grow from this and you will learn so much about yourself and the world. And that's a really beautiful thing. Um, I don't want to be too woo woo, but it's true. Like this is an opportunity for all of us to evolve and grow and be, become better people and uh, connect with others. And there's just, there is a lot of compassion. I have a lot of compassion for what you guys are going through. Not, not just for having gone through it in 2009, but also similarly going through it now. Um, and I know that I'm not alone. I know that uh, a lot of people are, we're rooting for you. And, but we, most importantly, we without a doubt believe that you will be, you will come out of this on the other side in, you know, great condition. <laughs> yeah, uh, one additional thing to add to that, um, it's okay to ask for help. Um, so you're coming out of this, you know, it's in certain times, you know, you might not be feeling great. It's okay to ask, uh, for help if you, you know, therapy is available. Um, you know, it's something that I, I did go through, um, and, you know, it, it, I, I advocate for it. You know, if that's something that you feel like you need, it's, you know, these are the times where that probably will become helpful. Um, it took me a while to like, sort of get around to the fact that I wanted to seek that type of um, help, but I, I do think that it's it's important. It has helped. So these are sort of those times where this become you know even more important. Yeah, one quick point that I want to add on. I think Manuel and Ricky touched on everything, and I think you guys should be uh, uh, should be following and taking heed on all of that advice. I think one thing that I want to address is that during this time, I've started noticing a lot of people comparing themselves to other people. And similarly for graduates who are, are for, for those of you seniors who've graduated, you may be comparing yourself with your peers, your, 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 your roommates and people who are close in your life, your cousins, uh, your relatives who may have jobs and have great jobs at that. And so don't compare yourself with anyone. And uh, you know, this is a time where it would be well worth it to read some leadership books uh, and, and see the, the stories of some of these incredibly successful people that you would consider role models and just see the trials and tribulations and challenges and the non-linear path that they all went through and just realize that not everyone's path is the same and someone may, you know, right out of undergrad have a fantastic job, but uh, that does not define their future or their success. And so just make sure that you're not comparing yourself with anyone because uh, that's not good for your mental and emotional health at all. And uh, just focus on yourself and improving yourself as much as you can day by day, step by step. And I think one thing that, you know, really helps with that. I mean, we live in this world now <laughs> and it is, technology based and we're always on our phones and we're always on social media um, especially people my age 
Um, it's really good sometimes um, as I'm getting older to just take some breaks from social media to stop looking at what other people are doing because sometimes it does get super distracting and it really does mess with your mental health if you're consistently um, on social different social media platforms. Um, I really appreciate all of your responses to that question. And we do have a few more questions. Um, so one question is, what advice do you have for us to embrace our uniqueness while standing out during this internship job season? I mean, I can speak to that. Um, I think this goes back to crafting your story and thinking creatively about what you bring to the table. Um, I think that your purpose and your why can be really powerful um, in differentiating you from other candidates. And I think also, you know, not discounting how you spend your time outside the job search. Like, what are you doing for volunteer work? What are your personal passions? Like, I love skincare and cats. And literally everybody who I work with knows those aspects about me. Um, and I think it makes for richer in office relationships. Um, but I think that also sharing, making some calculated shares of those parts of yourselves can also forge stronger relationships with the people you're networking with and interviewing with. I would also just say that every unique characteristic, uh, every quirk is, uh, is a strength and you should be proud of that. And that also takes time, really knowing who you are and, and being proud of that person. Um, it does take time, but that's absolutely something I wish I started uh, working on right away. So uh, really learning to love yourself and learning to, um, you know, yeah, recognize that all of everything that makes you you is very, very special and does make you unique is is also something to absolutely uh, take the time to to work on during this time as well. Just a quick point to add there. I, I think while it's very important for us to embrace and 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 be very proud of our unique traits and attributes that we bring to the table. I think at the same time, it's very important for you to um, be able to not try standing out too much um, and being too much of an outlier. You wanna be able to have the base level qualities, attributes that an employer is looking for in that specific job. You wanna be able to have that down and then differentiate yourself of what those unique characteristics are as Manuela mentioned and as uh, Stephanie mentioned, if it's volunteering, if it's mentorship, if it's you know, some sports on the weekend or something, you know, those, are, those are ways that you could try to differentiate yourself. But yeah, I'd, I'd say at, at a bare minimum, just try making sure that you hit the nail and check off the boxes of what they're looking for. Okay, and we will move on to our last question. And this actually is a question about Bates Bridge. And for the people that are on here that don't know what Bates Bridge is, um, you can kind of think of it as a LinkedIn, but only for Bait, current Bates students and Bates alumni to stay connected and to really just connect about um, what they did at Bates, their experience after Bates, and if you guys are looking for any of the people on the panel, they are all in Bates Bridge, so you guys can connect with them after um, the session. But uh, the last question for you guys is, do you think people are using Bates Bridge alumni and current students, and how can we uh, expand on the usage of Bates Bridge? That's actually kind of funny. I was actually re uh, contacted by a fellow product manager through Bates Bridge the last week, and we're actually having a conversation on Friday. So from, from my opinion, I did, people are using it. I just learned about it, but I am on it now, and you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, just one point about networking. Um, 
I like to practice what I call authentic networking. So not networking as like a way to get a job, but a way to really actually um, ask question. So maybe there's somebody from the Bates community that's a cinematographer and you're interested in it. Just asking them, hey, you know, can I take 15 minutes to ask you what your career trajectory looked like and what your day to day is? That is authentic networking. You're genuinely interested in understanding something about that person versus, oh, this person works at Airbnb. Um, hey, I'm a Bates grad. Like I saw this job. Authentic network is, is something that um, we should all be practicing and um, something that I, I try to do now. Um, basically, networking works really best long term versus short term. So um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on Bates Bridge now. So you're welcome to reach out to me and um, I'm, I will tell all my friends. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I beautifully said, Manuela. I think the authentic networking piece is incredibly important for recent grads. Um, I, I think a couple of folks like Ricky, I, I actually have had a couple of folks reach out in the past couple of weeks, uh, but it is very infrequent. So uh, it's, it's, I, I'm still not getting a lot of traction, uh, but I will say that Bates Bridge, I think is a fantastic platform, but people can reach out via the Bates directory, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, whatever, however way they could find us or me or other alums, uh, they should feel comfortable reaching out. Yes, reach out. Well, thank you guys all again for joining us tonight. Um, we really appreciate having so many of our alumni and students engaged in this event. I really have a feeling that our panelists may be getting some LinkedIn and Bates Bridge requests shortly. <laughs> yes, thank you, Maya, and thanks to all of our panelists um, for a really robust and engaging discussion. I'd also like to thank again the Bates Alumni Council and our colleagues in alumni engagement and advancement for all of their contributions to this program. Want to give a special shout out to Katie Hawkins, class of 05, and Tracy Peacock, class of 94, from the Alumni Council. Uh, my colleagues, Danielle Beckwith and Stephanie Navrat from Alumni Engagement. And of course, my very good colleague, Hoi Ming Nai, um, in the Bates Center for Purposeful Work in making this program come together. Um, for those of you who are seniors, please make sure to stay connected to Bates. We are here for you. Uh, and to everybody else, we hope you'll continue to watch out for opportunities to engage with purposeful work throughout the months and years to come. And with that, um, thank you all again, panelists and Maya for being a most excellent um, moderator. And I hope everybody has an excellent evening. Thank you.